In just a moment, you will hear a special broadcast as important as the great news of this day. You will hear the voices of some of the men who led the Allied armies in Western Europe to final victory. You will hear from Marshal Sir Bernard Montgomery, General Omar Bradley, British Air Marshal Tedder, Admiral Harold Stark, and others who will speak to you direct from Supreme Allied Headquarters in Western Europe. Come in, Supreme Allied Headquarters. This is the European Theater of Operation. Within the next few moments, you will hear messages from the Deputy Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force, the Commanding Generals of the Army Group, and the Admirals commanding the fleets of the United Nations in European waters. First, Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur William Tedder, who has been Deputy Supreme Commander to General of the Army Eisenhower since the formation of the Allied Supreme Command in 1943. Air Chief Marshal Tedder. At this, at this, at this pay my homage to the great leader under whose guidance and inspiration I have served since February 1943. Jenna, Sicily, Italy, Normandy, the liberation of Paris, the crossing of the Rhine, and the final overrunning of Germany. These are battle honors that few captains of history can equal. I know that all men and women of the United Nations are eager to understand the secret of these times. It is simply that General Eisenhower is the embodiment of the Allied team spirit, which has given our fighting men that unity of purpose which is their strength. The soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the United Nations have defeated the Germans because they have learned how to fight and work together against the common enemy. And this lesson they will learn from the example of their supreme commander. Today, naturally, we're thinking not only of past victories, but of future hope. I would say only this. In Europe, the Nazi and fascist power has been destroyed. The same evil power under a different name still remains in the Eastern Seas. When that evil is as completely exterminated as Nazi power is today, then our major task begins. May God help us all to maintain the same spirit of unity and cooperation by which alone we can win the peace for which we have been fighting. I'd like to end on a more personal note. This has been every man's and every woman's war. Regardless of uniform, rank, or race, the men and women of the United Nations have each made their own contribution in blood and sweat to victory. Today is their day. Your day. Well done, every one of you. Thank you, Air Chief Marshal Tedder. General Omar N. Bradley commanded the United States First Army on D-Day and led the American troops through the Battle of Normandy. He then became the commanding general of the 12th Army Group, now comprising the 1st, 3rd, 9th, and 15th Armies, and directed its operations through France and Belgium into the heart of Germany. General Bradley. When American troops forced the Normandy beaches on June the 6th, 1944, all United States ground forces were fighting under the command of the 1st United States Army. Within six weeks, with men and equipment pouring ashore, we had grown to a force twice the size of a normal army. On July 26th, this massive 1st Army attacked from behind its hedgerows to tear a gaping hole in the strong side of the enemy. By August the 1st, its 17 divisions had fanned out into the plains of France and were heading to cut off breath and lay the noose for the Argentan Ballet Trap. And so, on August the 1st, 
We divided this huge American force into two armies, the first and the third, with the 12th Army Group in command of both. It was a plan the group had been working on since the fall of 1943. In the nine months that followed, we have amassed two additional armies. Until today, the 12th Army Group comprises the 1st, 3rd, 9th, and 15th American Armies. It is the first wholly American group of armies to take the field in any war. It is the greatest accumulation of power and force in the nation's history. Our armies have speeded the liberation of France, Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg. They have fought 700 miles from the beaches to conquer half of Germany and join forces with the Russians. They have stabbed across the Czechoslovak border and into the hills of Austria. They have destroyed whole groups of German armies in the West, given hope to the peoples of Europe, and speeded the timetable for our war in the Pacific. The achievements of this group of American armies are monuments not only to the vitality and resourcefulness of the American people, but they are living evidence of the courage, the skill, and the bravery of those American soldiers who lie buried near the battlefield we have won. And those troops, the tens of thousands of them, recuperating in our hospitals today. We have captured more than two million enemy prisoners, 350,000 in the rear pocket, and a million since we crossed the Rhine. Germany was defeated when her armies were destroyed. Virtually every German that faced us in the original armies of the West has been killed wounded or taken a prisoner of war. At Argenton, the first army closed its trap to annihilate entire corps of the German army. It blocked enemy strength to the north, while our third army raced around the end and carved the enemy into prisoner pockets. Not until he reached his Siegfried line was the enemy able to recover from the terrifying cost of these battles. When von Neunstedt threw his three thick armies into the Ardennes, we smashed his armor, flung the remnants back, and broke through his great fortifications to overrun the Rhineland. Within a month, we had destroyed the German army destined to defend the Rhine, and crowded our cages with another quarter of a million German troops. Without slackening our stride, we crossed the Rhine to encircle the Ruhr and trap the German army that had hoped to save the heartland. Pushing quickly to the east while also attacking to our rear, we bypassed his mountain stronghold and bagged another 50,000. During the month of March, we captured on an average of a German division a day. This was increased during April. Today, I wish to commend every man and officer in this group of American armies I have been privileged to command. No greater armies and no finer troops have fought anywhere under any flag. And I want to express my deep appreciation to General Hodges of the 1st Army, General Patton of the 3rd Army, General Simpson of the 9th Army, and to General Giraud of the 15th Army. We have worked closely together, shifting divisions and corps at will over 400 miles front, and to give us complete flexibility and the power to concentrate anywhere at any time we chose. Germany is beaten completely and utterly beaten. The myth of her superiority has been buried with the German dead throughout the nations of Europe. But today, we must turn our efforts to the same third defeat of Japan. There can be no let-up, no slowdown, until the job is done. Only then shall we win the peace that will make this VE day a day of hope and promise for all generations. Thank you, General Bradley. Field Marshal Sir Bernard Law Montgomery has commanded the 21st Army Group since its formation. British, Canadian, and American troops have served under him, and his command has swept across Europe from Normandy to the Baltic on the northern flank of the Allied forces. Field Marshal Montgomery. On this day of victory in Europe, I feel I would like to speak to all who have served and fought with me during the last few years. What I have to say is very simple and quite short. I would ask you all to remember 
those of our comrades who fell in the struggle. They gave their lives that others might have freedom. And no man can do more than that. I believe that he would say to each one of them, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And we who remain have seen the thing through to the end. We all have a feeling of great joy and thankfulness that we have been preserved to see this day. We must remember to give the praise and thankfulness where it is due. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. In the early days of this war, the British Empire stood alone against the combined might of the Axis powers. And during those days, we suffered some great disasters. But we stood firm on the defensive, but striking blows where we could. Later, we were joined by Russia and America. And from then onward, the end was in no doubt. Let us never forget what we owe to our Russian and American allies. This great allied team has achieved much in war. May it achieve even more in peace. Without doubt, great problems lie ahead. The world will not recover quickly from the upheaval that has taken place. There is much work for each one of us. I would say that we must face up to that work with the same fortitude we faced up to the worst days of this war. It may be that some difficult times lie ahead for our country and for each one of us personally. If it happens thus, then our discipline will pull us through. But we must remember that the best discipline implies the subordination of self for the benefit of the community. It has been a privilege and an honor to command this great British Empire team in Western Europe. Few commanders can have had such loyal service as you have given me. I thank each one of you from the bottom of my heart. And so, let us embark on what lies ahead, full of joy and optimism. We have won the German war, let us now win the peace. Good luck to you all, wherever you may be. Thank you, Field Marshal Montgomery. The Commanding General of the Sixth Army Group, General Jacob L. Devers, was Chief of the Armored Force and Commanding General of the European Theater of Operations before leading the United States Seventh and the First French Armies in the invasion of southern France last August. Since then, his troops have fought their way through the Vosges Mountains, across the Rhine, and cracked the last stronghold of the Nazis in Germany. General Devers. This day will more than fill its page in history. Among the most significant pages in the annals of civilization, it has been written by the Allied nations with the labor of their civilians and the courage, determination, and the blood of their youth. Here on the continent of Europe, peoples, and nations have been rest from slavery and the human ideals of civilization have been saved from complete oblivion. There is consequently this moment of elation among all the nationals of allied countries and among our soldiers who have met and conquered the enemy at every battlefield. They have ended Nazi tyranny and the German dream of world conquest. And when this moment of elation has passed, I'm confident that in the hearts of the peoples, of many nations, there will be thankfulness and a prayer that this day may be the harbinger of lasting peace and a more enlightened and happier world. This prayer, I am equally confident, can be fulfilled by the continuing efforts of humanity, by our individual and collective efforts, with the help of Almighty God. Here in Germany, our guns are still in place, but they are silent. The planes of our strategic and tactical air forces are grounded or else moved across the sky with bomb bays empty. Our tanks are returning to assembly areas, and the infantry and engineers may rest at last along the rivers and roads and the villages and cities that mark their triumphs. This 
day has been brought about in this sector by the brilliant leadership of my Army commanders and their subordinate officers, by the continuing courage of the enlisted men of the 7th American Army and the 1st French Army, the leadership and courage of the Army detachments of the Alps and of the Atlantic. Their battle records are beyond mere commendation. No, George S. Patton. This is the European Theater of Operations. You're about to hear personal messages from the commanding generals of the Allied armies which have fought their way to final victory on the Western Front. First, General George S. Pat, who commanded the 2nd Armored Corps in Africa and the 7th Army in Sicily before assuming the leadership of the United States 3rd Army in its historic advances across France and Germany. General Pat. Now that victory in Europe has been achieved, let us review the Third Army's part in this epic struggle. From Avalanche to Brest, thence across France, Germany, and into Austria, the Third Army and its equally victorious comrades of the 19th Tactical Air Command have fought their way. The Seine, the Loire, the Moselle, the Star, the Rhine, and the Danube, not to mention Twenty other lesser rivers have been successfully stormed. The Siegfried Line has been penetrated at will. Metz, Trier, Koblenz, and Frankfurt, and countless other cities and towns have been cleared of the enemy. More than 80,000 square miles of country have been liberated or conquered. You have demonstrated your irresistible prowess in France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany, Czechoslovakia, and Austria. You have captured more than three quarters of a million Nazi soldiers and have killed or wounded at least half a million others. But in thinking of the heritage of glory you have achieved, do not be unmindful of the price you have paid. Throughout your victorious advances, your line of march is marked with the graves of your heroic dead, while the hospitals are crowded with your wounded. Nor should we forget the efforts of those at home, who have invariably provided us with the sinews of war, the means to victory. To those at home, we promise that with their unremitting assistance, we shall continue so that with the help of Almighty God and through the inspired leadership of our President and the High Command, we shall con conquer not only Germany, but also Japan until the last danger to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness shall perish from the earth. You have just heard the commanding officer of the 3rd Army, General George S. Patton, speaking from his headquarters in Europe. To Paris and Supreme Headquarters for Herbert Clark. And to San Francisco and News of the United Nations Conference from Ray Henley. We take you now to Washington. This is Wilfred Fleischer reporting from Washington. We still have a great task ahead in the Pacific, a war to be won. This is the picture as I see it now. Japan is being gradually encircled. She'll soon be completely cut off from her empire to the south. And the Japanese homeland will be blockaded by our navy. The Japanese navy is virtually non-existent. It cannot prevent a blockade of the home island. At the same time, our bombings of the Japanese homeland will be intensified. The Japanese have already admitted that over three million people are homeless in their cities. I've seen an official map of Tokyo here with the destroyed areas blacked out. Only half of the city is, is left. The remainder is only rubble. It's just as flat as only a Japanese city can be when it's burned to the ground. As flat as I saw Tokyo and Yokohama after the great earthquake of September 1st, 1923. That earthquake completely disrupted Japanese life. But it was then confined to the one area, now, all of the principal cities of Japan have been destroyed to the same extent. When we get bases functioning on Okinawa, besides those in the Marianas and at Iwo, we'll be in a position 
to keep up a constant day and night bombing of the Japanese homeland. No exact comparison can be made between the situation as it existed in Germany and that in Japan. The Germans were far better able to hold out. I'm not comparing the nations from a point of view of fanaticism, for I believe that the Japanese are just as fanatical as the Nazis were. But the Germans were able to hold out to the last because they had a superb network of railways and roads, and they were able to feed their people. The Japanese have no such system of communication. Their single railway is now overburdened with traffic. It has to take millions of refugees from the cities into the country. It has to bring food to the cities, and it has to carry troops and military supplies if Japan is to continue the war. When Japan's cities lie in ruins and when a system of communications breaks down, then I believe Japan will collapse. The will to fight is not enough these days. The Germans had that will, but it didn't save them from defeat. It's a question of production and of communication. So I don't foresee a long war with Japan, but a hard one. The greatest problem is what will happen after Japan's defeat at home. Large Japanese armies may continue to hold out on the continent of Asia, in Manchuria, China, Indochina, the Dutch East Indies, and in Malaya. And who's going to drive the Japanese out of those territories? Well, there are two points of view about this here. There are those who believe that once Japan has gone down to defeat at home, our task will be finished, that we should not sacrifice our troops to redeem other people's territories, that it's up to the Chinese, the French, the British, and the Dutch well, there are two points of view about this here. There are those who believe that once Japan has gone down to defeat at home, our task will be finished, that we should not sacrifice our troops to redeem other people's territories, that it's up to the Chinese, the French, the British, and the Dutch to free and regain their own territory. I think there's no dispute that the British, French, and Dutch are prepared to do so. But the question arises whether the Chinese will be able to evict an army of perhaps three million Japanese from their soil. There are those, on the other hand, who argue that once Japan is defeated, we cannot forsake our Chinese allies, that we owe it to the Chinese to help them in this task of evicting the Japanese. These people contend that if we fail to do so, we shall incur the animity of the Chinese people and their disappointment, and that they may well look to Russia then for their salvation instead of to us. This is a problem which we must face, and we must face it now, for it's the paramount problem ahead of us in the Pacific. This is Wilfred Fleischer in Washington. Now for a report from the British capital, we take you to Donald Coe in London. Donald Coe in London. The gay crowds are still milling around Whitehall, around Buckingham Palace, and throughout central London. King George and Queen Elizabeth came to the balcony of bomb-scarred Buckingham Palace to wave to the cheering crowds just after Mr. Churchill made his seven-minute announcement of victory in Europe. They were later joined by their two daughters, Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret Rose. Since then, Mr. Churchill has repeated his statement in the House of Commons amid cheers. Then he led Parliament to a church service of thanksgiving. Afterward, he came to a balcony on a government building near Number 10 Downing Street, while the crowd set up a terrific din. The weather on this first day of a double British holiday has not been helpful. It's warm and muggy. The sun comes out for a few moments at a time, but there have been sprinkles of rain. The streets are bright with flags, and the crowded sidewalks are bright, too, because many women are wearing gay summer dresses. Almost every civilian and many uniformed people are wearing a flag or a piece of bunting. The flag sellers seem to have an inexhaustible supply. It's now getting toward dinner time in London, and long lines are forming at the doors to restaurants. 
some people had reserved tables long ago for victory in Europe night. Other restaurants aren't taking any reservations. It's just first come, first serve. Many people, particularly families with children, are now streaming away from central London. They are leaving the celebrating to younger and more enthusiastic people, in many cases to men and women in uniform. Overhead, bombers and fighters have been swooping low all day, buzzing the city, singly and in larger formations. But there's an air of war, too, for the wartime blackout is still to be enforced on the five-mile-wide coastal strip all around the British Isles, although it may be lifted at any time. This is Donald Coe in London. I return you now to the Blue Network Newsroom in New York. Now we hear from General Eisenhower's headquarters in Paris. Go ahead, Herbert M. Clark. This is Herbert M. Clark at Allied headquarters in Paris. The final negotiations for this German surrender actually began last Friday, immediately after Admiral Friedeberg had surrendered the northern German defenses. On Saturday, he was brought to run, sufficiently calm or sufficiently tired, so that he slept through two plane trips and an automobile ride, waiting to enjoy and this will play the army, spam sandwiches and beer. And arriving in Rennes, just as news of the surrender of the German forces in the south to the 6th Army Group reached the red brick buildings which started life as the Ecole Professionnelle, a co-education and industrial college, have been successfully German and now allied headquarters. Friedeberg did not seem particularly upset. He even hummed as he washed and changed his collar before meeting General Smith. But his aide, Colonel Fritz Pollack, who had been sullen all the way, was even more nervous. Friedeberg and General Smith's allied group met for 22 minutes. General Smith outlining terms which, for the record, defined unconditional surrender as all forces to lay down their arms and remain in their present positions. Aircraft and sea craft not to be allowed to scatter from their positions. The overcommander of Wehrmacht, Germany's War Department, to forward and enforce all orders issued by the allies. Even at that stage, Friedeberg tried to split the Allies, wanted to surrender to the Americans and British, but not to the Russians. Well, that got the treatment it deserved, and the party went on, with Friedeberg finally sending a message to Dennis asking for either authority to make the surrender or for the presence of someone so empowered. General Eisenhower was kept informed of the progress of the negotiations, and he, in turn, kept in touch with Washington, Moscow, and London. Churchill phoned frequently. The Germans ate well. Frank, of all uncivilized things, martinis after dinner. Were given biscuits to go with them, pretty grudgingly, actually, by a private Joyce Bennett, who left off helping run a hotel in New York to wind up managing a house in Rhone, which is a billet for visitors to shake. They paced nervously through the long Sunday until shortly after 5 o'clock when Yodel arrived by plane, carrying full authority from the Dennis government. Yodel went to his room. He was visited by Friedeberg, who hadn't been told the name of the officer being set down to act with him, and who, instead of saluting as he saw a yodel, paused in the door of the room and laughed a curious, aha, aha, surprise and amusement. The two were closeted for a while with a pot of coffee and nap. They went to General Smith's room and conferred, argued for nearly three hours, retired, returned, and they signed. There had been expectancy. People hadn't seen so many staff cars flying around in months. Something was really up, and they could sense it. We knew it. And along those lines, I'd like to put one fact on record, that I am supremely delighted that it was the last time I shall have to know something I can't tell. The last time I'll have in my care a military secret so hot that I can't even trust it to the notebook that goes to bed, even practically into the bathtub with me. There's no more military security because there's no more war. This is Herbert M. Clark in Paris, returning you now to the Blue Network Newsroom in New York. Now for a report from Ray Henley. Go ahead, San Francisco. This is Ray Henley in San Francisco. Well, people out here at the Golden Gate are going about their business just about normal this morning. They've heard the announcements. They've listened intently to the statements of President Truman and the Prime Minister, Mr. Churchill. They've nodded their heads in approval. And then they proceeded to pick up their work without further ado. That's by way of saying that both the citizens of San Francisco and the delegates to the World Security Conference are taking today's news with eyes front, with attention directed on the Pacific, and with a pretty firm conviction that there'll be some real fireworks out there in the days immediately ahead. 
I think the reaction of this entire area has been expressed very well by San Francisco's Mayor Roger Lapham, who has just made this statement. He said, For us to recognize German surrender by any widespread celebration at a time when there is still a job to do against Japan would be an affront to our allied fighting men in the Pacific. The mayor's comment is being punctuated here this morning. Streetcars and buses filled with workers bound for neighboring shipbuilding and repair yards and the arsenals around here. And San Francisco's famous waterfront is teeming with ships and men loading the tools which will bring still another victory day, the day of victory against Japan. That's the picture here. There's very little, if any, merrymaking. There's no dancing in the streets and no confetti. As to the meetings of the World Security Conference, we'll have a rather brief observance of VE Day by the conference. All of the committee meetings will open with one minute of silence. And after the silence, back to work. Victory in Europe will have a further beneficial effect on the deliberations of the Security Conference, just as a sign of approaching victory for some days already has had its effect. Delegates are beginning to talk of winding up this conference in another two or three weeks. There's a sense of urgency among the delegates, and the reason is perfectly plain. Many of the delegates are important officials in their respective governments, and those officials are needed back home. But these same delegates fully realize that this conference, the work of this conference, can't be put off. If you want to have a world organization ready to start operating by the time Japan is defeated and by the time new political and economic problems come to the front in Europe. After a charter for a new world organization has been agreed to here, after the Constitution, so to speak, has been put down black on white, the matter of United States entry into the world organization will go before the United States Senate. So the work being done here is only the first step, and you'll probably find most of the other countries hesitating to take the second decisive step, the step of formally adhering to the charter that's being written here, until they find out if the United States, this time, actually will become part of the organization which the American delegation is so ably helping to build here. The end of the war in Europe will not end the memory of the robot bomb and the feeling that if there should be another war, that entire civilian populations will be involved. And that feeling has done more than anything else to speed up the negotiations here in San Francisco. Thank you, Ray Henley. Two remaining who made the original landing said, I want to propose another toast. And now his voice was quiet. Gentlemen, let us drink a toast to the men of I Company who are not here with us today. Thank you, Gordon Frazier. Ladies and gentlemen, during the past half hour, you have heard the official proclamation of victory in Europe as delivered by President Harry S. Truman. You have also heard the voice of Prime Minister Winston Churchill speaking to you from London. From Paris, you heard... Herbert M. Clark at General Eisenhower's headquarters, Gordon Frazier with the First Army. In Washington, Martin Agronsky. In New York, Leland Stowe. This is the Blue Network of the American Broadcasting Company. News and a roundup of our Blue Network correspondents abroad. The Allies have announced the unconditional surrender of Germany. Victory in Europe is officially proclaimed by President Truman and Prime Minister Churchill. In his announcement to the world... Churchill said the Germans unconditionally surrendered all their land, sea, and air forces in Europe. Actual signing of the capitulation took place at 2.41 a.m. Monday, European time. Allied radios have broadcast word to all German ships at sea to go to the nearest port, there to await further orders. Earlier, Grand Admiral Donitz announced that all German weapons would be silent, effective at 5 p.m. Eastern wartime. Churchill and President Truman made their VE announcements almost simultaneously starting at 9 a.m. Eastern wartime. And although the surrender was made to all the Allies, no announcement came from the Moscow radio. It had been expected that Premier Stalin would make such a talk. In his brief talk by radio, President Truman said that General Eisenhower had informed him that Germany had surrendered unconditionally. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for a special broadcast, we take you now to Washington. And the war goes on. The lights are going on in darkened Europe. The day of victory there has been proclaimed. We thank Almighty God for this triumph. 
We honor the heroic living and the heroic dead of the Allied armies, the Allied navies, the airmen, and the underground forces of liberation who never gave up throughout the long night of Nazi oppression. As we pay tribute to the valor of our combat forces across the Atlantic who have won this great victory, let us also remember and pay tribute to the valor of our combat forces across the Pacific who still fight on in the heat of the day. For they have a tough and blood-stained road ahead, and it is up to us to see them through. Although Japan is fighting alone, she is strong, and she is still fighting with cunning and tenacity. Let us not think that Japan has not prepared herself for this day of victory in Europe. Let us not think that the defeat of her Nazi ally has caught her by surprise. Let us not think that she was not aware that one day she would have to bear the full brunt of our force alone and made plans accordingly. Japan has been preparing herself for this for a long time, and most particularly since the successful Allied landings in Normandy last June showed that Germany was going to be crushed between our forces on the west and the great Russian armies advancing inexorably from the east. Japan has organized herself for total war on an intricate pattern in which nearly every man, woman, and child has a part to play, a part dedicated to the killing of Americans. It is up to us to see that our united force is exerted the other way. Vast resources are still at the disposal of the Japanese. They still, still sit astride some of the world's great trade routes. They have millions of fighting men, war factories still out of our bombers' reach, huge stockpiles of essential materials of war, and a population that will deny itself everything the Japanese combat forces need. Recent reports indicate that relatively few consumer goods are being produced, but that all industrial productive capacity is being utilized for increasing the output of war equipment and military supplies. All factories, large and small, and even home or family units have been mobilized under government control and supervision to manufacture war materials. The Japanese claim that many of their plants are being dispersed or moved underground to escape air raids. In nearby inner zone areas under Japanese control, Manchuria, Korea, and North China, the same intense activity is going on. Few of the large industrial plants in these areas have been touched by our bombers. These factories are near sources of raw material are equipped with comparatively new and up-to-date machinery and manned with an adequate supply of laborers. Some are still out of range of our bombers and will remain hard to reach until we can establish bases much nearer than Okinawa. To guarantee the transport of material to and from areas in this inner zone, the Japanese have extensively improved railroad facilities, double-tracked many of the main lines, have built new docks, warehouses, and piers at port cities, and have mobilized large forces of dock workers to load and unload cargoes. The Japanese say that they are giving particular attention in this regard to their west coast ports and to the ports across the Sea of Japan in Korea. Not all of these will be easy to reach with our bombers, even from Okinawa. The complete severance of communications between Japan and the southern areas will not seriously affect Japan's food situation, with the exception of sugar from Formosa. The Japanese are still producing the bulk of their rice requirements and are supplementing this output with other grains and with imports from Korea. Tremendous quantities of potatoes are being grown for food and alcohol, and there are ample supplies of soya beans being produced in Manchuria. The Japanese government has not lost sight of the importance of winning the support of subject peoples. A few weeks ago, the Japanese gave seats in their diet to the peoples of Korea and Formosa, who have long been under the harsh domination of Japan and who are awaiting their day of liberation. Thus, the Japanese government has made a gesture of equality to these peoples, 
giving them the semblance of representation. Political moves of this nature are, of course, well recognized by the peoples of Korea and Formosa as empty gestures, but such moves nevertheless illustrate the firm determination of Japan to leave no stone unturned in strengthening itself for the continued prosecution of the war. The Japanese policy of establishing so-called independent governments in occupied areas outside of the empire, most recent illustration of which is Indochina, is part of the same program. But the Japanese militarists must know by now that they will be crushed. The handwriting is on the wall. We are blasting their defenses by land and sea and air. We are separating Japan from our overseas conquests and gaining positions for new assaults. Our offensive is relentless and inexorable. We are determined to destroy Japan's war-making power once and for all. But the Japanese propose to make our victory as costly as possible. They are capable of finding a mad sense of glory in fighting on alone. Theirs is a fanaticism which does not count the odds or costs in human lives. The decision, however, rests with us, not with them. And I know that the American people, with their allies, knowing that peace is indivisible, will devote their full and overwhelming force to the completion of the worldwide victory so magnificently begun today. And today, while we salute with reverence and pride our honored dead, let us have constantly in mind those inspired words of Lincoln. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. From the conference chamber in the Department of State, the Blue Network of the American Broadcasting Company has presented the Acting Secretary of State, the Honorable Joseph C. Grew. We return you now to the Blue Network Newsroom in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, let's see what's going on in London. We're calling in our Blue Network correspondent in London, Donald Cole. Come in, Donald Cole. This is Donald Cole in London. The British capital paused a few minutes ago to hear Prime Minister Winston Churchill in the same rolling tones that he rallied this country in the dark days after Dunkirk. He told the world that it was victory in Europe. For hours now, some Londoners have been celebrating... Others have been giving thanks in church services. Some have had to go on with their regular work, maintaining essential services. Many of the uniformed soldiers, sailors, and airmen clustered in Piccadilly Circus or among the government buildings along Whitehall knew that the victory in Europe does not mean civilian clothes for them, not while there's still war in the Pacific. The civilians knew, too, that many of the hardships of wartime Britain, the bombings and the blackout, were over, but that many hardships, food and clothes rationing first and foremost, would continue. In restaurants, bars, and everywhere on the streets, people listened attentively. Mr. Churchill was cheered when he said that the, on the, that the Channel Islands will be freed today. The crowds were more quiet when he said, today we may think of ourselves, tomorrow we should think of those in the field. The Prime Minister brought smiles with the fierceness with which he spoke of the foul aggression. Then he warned of Japan's greed and treachery. The Prime Minister spoke for less than seven minutes, probably one of the shortest radio speeches he has made. In the streets, there was a holiday spirit. The more exuberant loosed some of their enthusiasm and spent some of their money celebrating last night. There were crowds in the entertainment district. 
Many bars were sold out long before closing time. Tonight, they can stay open longer, but for some, it was a question whether they'd have anything to sell unless they get emergency supplies. For many housewives, this VE day began with a long wait at the local baker's shop. Stores will only be open for a couple of hours today and tomorrow. The early morning church services were only lightly attended. But by noon, there were crowds waiting to get into St. Paul's Cathedral and other churches. Pealing church bells could be heard for hours. An investiture was held at Buckingham Palace today at which King George awarded decorations to enlisted men of the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Some of the awards were for heroism and gallantry at Alamein and at Salerno, two battles that made today's victory in Europe possible. Crowds have been gathering at the palace throughout the morning. And that is how London is celebrating VE Day. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a couple of moments, we will bring you on this network a special broadcast by Five Star Generals. You will hear the voices of some of the men who led the Allied armies in Western Europe to final victory. That's at 10 o'clock in two minutes from now. Now let us see how New York is celebrating VE Day. We take you now to Gene Kirby in Times Square. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Gene Kirby speaking to you in Times Square, New York City on a day that a great many people here in New York will long remember. It's been officially announced that VE Day has arrived. President Truman, Prime Minister Churchill, and General Eisenhower were on the air this morning, officially proclaiming this VE Day. Now, in front of the uh, Hotel Astor flower shop, a great crowd has collected. I can say truthfully that it's not as large a crowd as was here yesterday when it was unofficially announced from Reims, France, that the Germans had surrendered. That announcement from France, touched off a celebration the likes of which Times Square has not seen in many a year. Approximately 500,000 people were gathered here in Times Square at the height of the celebration. Nothing like that has occurred so far this morning. We have no doubt, though, that something will occur just as soon as word gets around that this is officially VE Day and as soon as the department stores and all the office buildings let their office help out for the day. I can say right now that uh, several of the film companies already have their cameras grinding. Ladies and gentlemen, during the past quarter hour, you have heard a summary of the news. You have heard from Under Secretary of State Joseph C. Grew, Donald Cole reporting from London, and Gene Kirby speaking from Times Square in New York. This is another one of the programs presented during the day by the Blue Network to give you a complete coverage of the news on this VE Day. This is the Blue Network of the American Broadcasting Company. For further news about victory in Europe, the Blue Network now takes you to Herbert M. Clark at General Eisenhower's headquarters in Paris. Go ahead, Herbert Clark. Yes, yes, it's over. Europe is at peace. And this is Herbert M. Clark reporting from Supreme Allied Headquarters as though that had any more importance than that I've been waiting to give you this news just as anxiously as you have been waiting for official confirmation to limp in behind yesterday's flashes, sent in direct violation of a pledged word in what correspondents here have described to the War Department as the greatest double-cross in the history of journalism. This delay is not the fault of General Eisenhower. That must be made clear. He wanted to announce the surrender when it took place at 2.45 o'clock on Monday morning. He was restrained by orders from Washington, London, and Moscow, governmental level. Chiefs of states wanted to reveal the news, and they themselves scooped. That is the sad part, that this moment, which should have been filled with the great joy of fulfillment, of a task well completed, and even greater than that, the knowledge that a great evil force has been crushed. It's news that the people of the world and their armies deserved when it was made. And this confirmation that it was made is not at second hand or at hearsay. I can confirm it with my own eyes. I was one of a group of 16 selected correspondents who watched Lieutenant General Walter Beadle Smith, General Eisenhower's deputy, accept the surrender of all Germany's remaining forces on land, on sea, and in the air from Colonel General Gustav Jodl, Chief of Staff of the Wehrmacht. Tall, spare, jittery, but still arrogant. A man who flipped the most casual and disdaining of salutes to the officer who received him on behalf of Schaefe as he stepped out of a plane on the command airstrip. Admiral Hans George Friedeberg, the man who replaced Donitz when the Nazi sailor stepped into Hitler's shoes as Germany's Führer and who had surrendered northwestern German Europe, 
sign for the German fleet. Looking tired, confused, completely beaten, his eyes sunken deep into his swarthy cheeks. They sat to sign in the main shape war room, a converted lecture hall with lofty ceilings and pale blue walls covered by maps and charts for which the Germans would have given a right arm or a division even three months ago. They sat opposite General Smith, who had Lieutenant General Carl Spotts and Major General Henry Bull with him as American representatives. Admiral Sir Harold Burrow, Lieutenant General Sir Frederick Morgan, Air Marshal Sir James Robb, and Major General Kenneth Strong representing Great Britain. Major General Ivan Suslaparov, speaking for Russia. Major General Francois Seves, representing France. The signing wrote an end to the war in Europe five years, eight months, and four days after Hitler set out to conquer the world, to submit the world to a civilization represented by the Gestapo and stormtroop thugs who starved and beat and tortured. It was 11 months and a day from the beginning, from the morning of Ju the 6th of June last year, when I came to the coast of Normandy with the first troops to invade France. From the beginning to the end in final negotiations, which began on a lowering Sunday evening and finished eight and a half hours later as the Germans, torn between rage and despair, affixed their signatures to the wit of death for this threat to civilization and strode out and up a flight of stairs to where General Eisenhower waited to receive them with his British deputy, Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder. Later, General Eisenhower came back to the war room to record his message, and here is what he said. February 1943, the late President Roosevelt and Premier Churchill met in Casablanca. There, they pronounced the formula of unconditional surrender for the Axis powers. In Europe, that formula has now been fulfilled. The Allied force, which invaded Europe on June 6, 1944, has, with its great Russian allies and forces advancing from the south, utterly defeated the Germans by land, sea, and air. This unconditional surrender has been achieved by teamwork. Teamwork not only among all the Allies participating, but among all the services, land, sea, and air. To every subordinate that has been in this command of almost five million Allies, I owe debt of gratitude that can never be repaid. The only repayment that can be made to them is a deep appreciation and lasting gratitude of all free citizens of all the United Nations. That was the voice of General Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander, speaking after the ceremony which took place in the cathedral and Champagne city of Rennes, 54 miles east across the lovely rolling French countryside from Compiègne, where the Allies accepted a weak and vacillating surrender to the Germans last time, and where, in 1940, Adolf Hitler danced a jig on the grass as he forced the capitulation of France. There's no more threat now, no more war. There's peace in Europe. There is joy, not fear, over the face of Europe. The whistles and horns of Paris, the sirens which once spoke only to warn of bombing raids, they're shrieking peace even as I speak. There is still a war to be won in the Pacific. Don't spend too much time celebrating this initial victory, but it is a victory which has been well and truly won. It came, finally, too late for one of its greatest architects, for Franklin Roosevelt, who was in every thought today. Even the announcement is late, but it is here. Peace has come back to Europe. It will come back to the world. This is Herbert M. Clark at Allied Headquarters, returning you now to the Blue Network Newsroom in New York. Here in New York is Leland Stowe. The killing in Europe is over. That's truly wonderful. We call it peace. But it isn't really peace yet, not even in Europe. It can't be peace until we finish the job in and with Germany. That should take 20 or 25 years. But what's the next step? The first step is that the big four takes over. The United States, Britain, Soviet Russia, and France must begin immediately to run Germany. The Allied Control Commission will do the job. General Eisenhower will be our chief representative. Field Marshal Alexander for Britain. Also, a Russian general and a French general. These four generals and their staffs have tremendous jobs to do. They must launch a gigantic manhunt to round up scores of thousands of Nazi leaders and other war criminals. They must divide Germany quickly into four zones of occupation. Whole armies of laborers must be mobilized at once to repair Germany's communication. 
millions of foreign slave laborers and war prisoners must be sorted out, sent home. Germany's heavy war industries must be taken over. Germans must be put to work growing all possible food as fast as they can. These are just a few of the absolutely urgent jobs to be tackled. Then there's Germany's press and radio. It must be controlled. It must make the German people realize what they have done. And so these are some, just a few, of the great jobs immediately ahead for the Allied Control Commission. This is going to be a terrific test in teamwork. For the first time, the Western Allies must work with Russians closely on a great task day after day. That is going to be the big test as to whether or not we can cooperate over the years with the Soviet government. So I should say whether the Allied Control Commission has its center in Berlin or in Vienna or some other city, there is going to be laid the foundations of Allied cooperation, the big three and the big four, whichever way you want to put it. And in that respect, we must find out how we can get ahead. Well, we've got a wonderful man to represent us there, General Eisenhower, a man who is a great administrator and a wonder at creating a team. That gives us hope for tomorrow. Thank you, Leland Stowe. The Blue now calls in its correspondent with the First Army in Germany, Gordon Frazier. Come in, Gordon Frazier. This is Gordon Frazier with Hodges' First Army in Central Germany. Victory Day in Europe. Here's what happened at I Company of the 33rd Armored Regiment, 3rd Armored Division, just a little while ago. It is a warm day here in Germany and bright with sunshine. At I Company CP, a small cluster of wooden barracks formerly occupied by Hitler Youth Girls, American soldiers who only a week and a half ago were fighting a bloody battle at Dessau on the Elbe River, today were lazing around, taking it easy. A holiday had been declared. A tall, blue-eyed, rusty-haired lad from Gatesville, Texas, who had fought his way through from the beaches, Sergeant Juan Haynes said, It isn't as if you were sweating it out under shell fire and someone gave the order, Cease firing, but it sure is a great relief. The commanding officer of the company, from Henderson, Kentucky, Lieutenant Thomas A. Cooper, beribboned with decorations and medals of honor stemming from the day he landed at Normandy, said, I don't believe the soldiers realize it yet, and they won't until they actually set foot in the state. At the appointed hour, Lieutenant Cooper assembled his men in the mess hall, each one standing by his place, and there was an intent look on the faces of his soldiers as he began to read. To every member of the 3rd Armored Division, our Supreme Commander, General Eisenhower, has given to this division a supply of wine for our part in the crossing of the Rhine River. Let us today, 8th of May, 1945, raise our glasses in a toast to the Allied victory that has been made possible through his great leadership. Signed, Doyle A. Hickey, Brigadier General Commanding. And Lieutenant Cooper said, gentlemen, a toast to the Supreme Commander.